So if you've been testing it up to this point, we have this project where we've got our sign-up system working. Again, there's no advanced encryption or anything like that. We don't need that at the moment yet. But there is a way to create accounts. And so uh, I'll do one more here. Peter, oh, and then again, uh, based, the capitalization uh, won't uh, matter um, because ultimately this data is being saved to uppercase. So I'm creating the account again. Again, just typing whatever password. It's just very easy to type a simple password. It's not saying anything like, make sure your password is eight characters long and make sure it has numbers and symbols. We haven't programmed that. We might get to that a little later, but right now any password would work, even just simply the number one, which would be a terrible password. But any sort of password works. Click join. Oops, passwords don't match. Okay, make sure you spell it right. It's all spelled same case. There we go. Okay, ready to go. So um, you're seeing the output over here that the regular user wouldn't see, but yeah, I misspelled cats. Okay, don't match. That pops up like I expected. Passwords do match. Account doesn't exist. This account that had uppercase, lowercase sprinkled in now is all uppercase. Uh, okay, log in. We'll then go to the login screen. Good, so now we'll deal with the whole login screen. This has not been programmed yet to actually log in. If I try to log in with the account I just created, um, Peter, and then spelling won't matter eventually, Parker, I call it org, right? And then password doesn't matter at the moment. Well, big error because login has not been programmed. Let's set up login. It's not testing it at all yet. Does the account exist? Is the password correct? It's not doing any of that at all. So we get a big scary error message. Okay, so what we need to do is start to set up our login screen. We need to set up a way to pay attention to the person clicking go, and then run a bunch of code that deals with the result of a person clicking go. So very similar to login, we have to create objects. We have to create an object of the form that pays attention to the submit button and then looks at each of the fields. We have to do that in login. Create an object for the form, waiting for submit, and then check these fields, and then do some other magic. So back to the code. Um, just to show you on the index file, what we should already have set up, pg login, the HTML file, pg login, we've got a form with an ID form login. We need to write some JavaScript that references that ID so that then we can deal with submit. Well, our submit is named go, but it's a submit button. So this will be very reminiscent of what we did with sign up. Login will be very similar. In the JavaScript, at the top where we are defining all of our objects, we've got an element for the form to sign up, stuff related to signing up, comma, next line. Now we're going to create an object. We're going to create an object on the next line that deals with login. So make sure that's a comma before the next line dollar l form login jquery selector end of statement make a variable comma and and another one and another one and another one comma final one for the moment semicolon l form login the jquery selector is basically document dot get element by id as we've seen before pound sign form login go find an ID with that name go find an element with that ID pound sign and now we can reference it in the world of JavaScript with a jQuery based variable L form sign up worked when we clicked submit, 
which then ran a function that did a bunch of things after submittal. We need the same thing here. We need an event listener. We need to listen. We need to wait for someone clicking Submit. Once they click Submit, run a function with a bunch of steps. So the exact same thing for sign up will be for login. Let's go to the end of our code. The very last line I had there, our submit event handler waiting for submittal. So in general, this is how our code is going to be. We create all of these objects at the very beginning of the code so that we may use them later in the code. We have these handlers at the end of the code, which then sort of jump back to the middle of the code where the actual longer definition is at. If we put them out of order, if we create the objects and then have these event handlers and then have the function, sometimes that causes problems. Because remember, it reads from top to bottom. So if it gets to the part where it says submit, but the function doesn't exist, you might get an error. So we have the objects, then the functions, then the event handlers. So we're going to start to set up l form login dot submit when there has been when the submit button has been pressed or enter on the keyboard we will run a function there was an event that happened and we are calling a specifically named function <coughs> so remember oh okay good good thank you 10 points so um, we're going to run a function here. And again, I really recommend to, to create the pairs as soon as possible because you're going to lose track of these. Unless you've got your auto fill, auto completion turned in, you're going to lose track of which one opens, which one closes. Because we've got this here. And if I look at it like that at a distance, it makes sense open, close, open, close. But if I were to start to write in here, parenthesis, event, oh, there's my closing one, then the next one, I'm missing something there. So be careful here. Write your pairs right away. Event. We're going to call or we're going to invoke. We're going to run. We're going to execute a function called login, which doesn't exist yet. And then we'll back up to actually define that function in a moment. So we've got a JavaScript object referencing an HTML element. When there is a submit button pressed, run a function. The event of submit has happened. Run a function called function login, passing in the event so that we can prevent default. The default is that scary message that appears when we try to log in. That XML parsing error, it assumes that we're running a, a, a classic form on a server. We're not. We're running it in a device. So we get a big XML parsing error. We want to prevent the default behavior. So we'll back up and we'll define what does it mean? What does function login mean? That doesn't exist in JavaScript. We're inventing it. And I like to add a comment so that you don't lose track of that final curly brace. This is the end of that function. Login, sorry, yes. Well, it's a comment, so it could be called that, and that'd be fine. But yes, that function login. OK, so the very first thing we did in the sign up function was prevent the default behavior of that weird error that error happens because oftentimes a form traditionally would run on a web server we're not on a web server so in the event the default event that happens of that refresh prevent default don't refresh stuff and that will stop that error message
I think it's useful to then also um, have a little console log here, especially when you're first um, when you're first um, getting used to programming and such um, to do your output, your console output, and I would like to have it say running function login. My console, at the very least, can confirm what's supposed to be happening from clicking login is this function <coughs> is supposed to start to run. Save it and run it, and confirm that you're getting this console log before we go further. Because we have to set up the object, we have to set up the event handler, we have to set up the function. Three things that could go wrong. Even though it doesn't look like we've done that much, three things could go wrong. So confirm in your console that at least you get the running this function message. You shouldn't get that XML parsing error anymore. Let me take a quick check on mine before I claim that mine works. So if I refresh, log in, doesn't matter what we fill in here technically yet. Doesn't care as long as it's email looking and a password. Running function login. That's all we need so far. It's not checking if the user exists yet. At the very least, it should work that, OK, we're paying attention to the button. If we're confirming that the function is running, that means that we have created the object properly way back on line 10 or something. That means we've also created the event handler. Well, look at that, 100 lines of code so far. We're like one-tenth of the way through our code. And then that is confirming that we've created the event handler and that we're running a function. Running a function. What's going to happen in the world of this function is that I need to then um, see what did the person type into those fields. Once we see what they've typed in those fields, we have to check, do we have in local storage that email saved? Yes or no. Once we confirm, yes, we have that person saved, then we have to check, is does the password match? So there's going to be more about um, reading the value of those fields and if-else statements to check if it exists, if it doesn't exist, if the passwords match, if the passwords don't match. So we're going to do similar things to what we've done in the log in, uh, in the sign up function. First, we create some variables. We create some objects that represent what they've typed into those boxes. The boxes right here in email login and in password login. Dollar L in email login equal to jQuery selector pound in email login. There is some element that we're looking for in the login screen input field email S uh, store a reference to that input field in this variable in this object the login screen also has a password comma also then create an object l in password login pound in Password login. What did I miss? Though? Password. Password. Sorry, password. There we go. So ln password login. Now, again, if I had misspelled this further times, that technically wouldn't have been a misspelling because I'm creating a brand new object. While we're here also, comma, um, previously in sign up, we allowed the person 
to type in a password, any password and any email, which we then converted to uppercase. So the data we've got stored in local storage has been turned to uppercase. So while we're creating variables here, we're also then going to create uppercase versions of what they typed into those fields. Temp val in email login is equal to dollar l in email login dot val dot to uppercase method parentheses so they typed something in to the input field email we're storing a reference to the whole input field right here then here we're saying let's look at the value what did they type what did they actually type in here and convert it to uppercase store that in a temporary variable a temporary object we need to do the same thing for the password temp a temporary copy of the value of the input field password in the login screen and that's set to the object l in password login the uh, object right there the value in that object and convert it to uppercase and then end of statement there one semicolon at the end of these four statements they're technically one statement if I had a semicolon at the end, it would be four statements, but then they'd all need a bar at the beginning. So we've done something like this before, but we'll write a little comment. Uh, create objects of the input fields in the login screen. Then create temporary objects or variables that have been uppercased. Probably not a real word, but we get the idea. That have been converted to uppercase would be proper. Again, giving yourself feedback as a developer is very important as you build the project step by step so you give it a shot to write uh, some console output to confirm to yourself that you're typing something into those fields when you click submit so you need to write two more lines of code after these so that you can see what the person has typed into those boxes in the console Try that yourself. It doesn't make sense. I'll do it in a moment. But you try to do that. Give yourself console output to see what did they type into those input fields. So we've, we've done this several times. We've done console output. Now you see if you can pull from what we've done so far on your own. Try to see what did I type into those fields as we test it.
Okay, so what we're simply trying to do here is if we are able to um, store the values of what they're typing, this is just a simple matter of console log with some fancy message maybe just so that you know what you're outputting to yourself. Um, email was, you know, if you didn't write that, that's fine. But obviously what you needed to write was the actual variable, temp val in email log in. And I also want to see what was the password typed in. For debugging purposes, being verbose, typing, typing it out um, very explicitly is very valuable because then it helps you debug. Because a lot could go wrong. You, you notice one misspelled letter and it goes wrong. And JavaScript is like that. That literally one wrong letter shuts down your whole code. What follows. So if all of your code previously worked up to this point, if your previous 100 lines of code worked, and then I made this mistake right here, <coughs> nothing following will work after that. That's just the way JavaScript is. It shuts down after it reaches the first error. So that might possibly be a way to debug. Well, I know it worked up to this point. Let me reread my code past that point. Oh, I see my mistake. Now, this is uh, completely op optional here, but this is part of the aesthetics that I mentioned before. That looks nice. So um, I'm going to test this, and I'm going to see if um, in the login, I'm not trying to put in a real account yet. I'm just checking. Is the JavaScript, did I write the JavaScript properly to read what is in the fields? No matter what's in the fields yet, that's still coming. Let's see here. So refresh, log in. Fill in whatever. Go. I am seeing this. I'm running my function, login, line 92. Line 101 and 102 then says the email that was typed in was that. Obviously, I typed it lowercase. To uppercase is working. It made it uppercase. I typed in a password that you couldn't see, lowercase. Now the password is there. It's It's been converted to uppercase and this is for myself as the developer to see step by step is it doing what it's supposed to are we at the very minimal even capturing what's in those fields and that was here If it doesn't do that, of course, it's probably just a little simple misspelling somewhere. The way I would try to figure that out is if it gives you an error, go to the line that it tells you, scan through that line, and see if your spelling is correct. And remember, it might be useful to double click to select a little bit of text, and it should then highlight where else it exists. Then you can compare. Okay, capital I, capital L, oh, lowercase i, there's my error. So select a little piece of code, and it should highlight in other parts where it exists. And then you can confirm uh, spelling and such. Or like when I did, you know, con, I misspelled console, console. Well, I scanned my code. That's correct. That's correct. What did I miss? Oh, console. Again, this doesn't line up here. This uh, log doesn't line up. That's a little sort of pseudo message to myself. Something's not properly typed. And this that I did here is just optional, but that looks nice, nicely lined up. It should not affect your either results of your code. That looks nice here because I can easily see the names of the objects uh, referencing these HTML elements or the original element. Next line. So we're going to have a whole huge block of if-else. 
um, checking to see if this user exists and such. We need to check, does the user exist? That's one thing. Is the password correct? That's the second thing. If the user doesn't exist, we'll give them a message. Create an account, please. If the user does exist, then we need to check, is your password correct? Um, if the password is correct, then actually finally log them in to PG, uh, PG Home. We can note here if else to check if user exists in local storage. We need our if else skeleton. So we're going to check do they exist? Yes. Do something, or else no, it doesn't exist. Do something else. What's that? Oh yes, comment line, yes. Thank you. Comment. Okay, so um, local storage dot get item, local storage dot set item. Set item is that we saved the user. Get item is that we retrieve the data or check if it exists. Uh, so in our if portion here, local storage object dot get item method. We're trying to get a person's email that was saved in the system. Temp val in email login. A person is trying to log in. L in email login. A person is trying to log in with an email address. The temp version is the version converted to uppercase. When we previously did set item, we saved a copy of their email uppercase. It has to be uppercase. So we are trying to get, we're trying to see if that email address exists in local storage. So we have the triple equals null. Is it true that this email does not exist, is what we're asking there. So this is sort of the opposite. Is it true that they don't exist, is what we're asking here. Console log, user doesn't exist. And it'd be good to output what are they trying to log in with. Because if else statements, basically, the way we've got them here, check for two possibilities. The one possibility is that the user doesn't exist. What's the other possibility? User, user already exists, yes. So then give yourself some output that says user does exist.
and just confirming what we expect that a user does exist with a certain email. We're not checking the password yet. You see how there has to be these layers. First check if they exist, yes or no. Okay, then check if the passwords match, yes or no. Then let them in fully. But at this point, save it and run it, and we'll pause to see if this works. At the very least, now, it should be able to tell you, does it see that that email exists, yes or no? It still won't fully log you in, we're not there yet. But at the very least, it should confirm that email address has been used or has not been used. So go ahead and save and run it and test it. If it doesn't work, let's fix that. Check mine. So I'm going to try to log in with something that I know doesn't exist. Password, email, user doesn't exist. This does not exist in local storage. I can confirm that over here. In local storage, I have all of these names. I'm going to try to log in with an account that does exist. Now this is all this is all uppercase in local storage. That's fine. Peter at Parker.org. Password doesn't matter yet. Very secure password. Click go. I'm running the function to log in. The email that was typed in was that. The password was that. And the user does exist. So it did find it in local storage. Let's pause here. Let's make sure this works. If it doesn't work, call me over. Obviously, this needs to work at this point, or else we're stuck. So here's what we've got so far. Remember to check your console, F12. And if it gives you a line number, go to that line number and see if you can figure it out.
All right, everyone, let's go on here to add a little bit more. <clears throat> let's go on here to add a little bit more, please. So um, at this point, what we've got is simply checking that it exists or doesn't exist. Well, uh, once we've got this if-else, then we can uh, actually check, does the password match or not? Well, we're getting output in the console that says user doesn't exist. We did little pop-ups to the user, letting them know there is a problem. So let's set up some pop-ups inside of the um, if-else. Uh, so we're going to do something very similar to how we did those pop-ups for the for the sign up. So we need to go over back to the index.html file, create some divs for those pop-ups, and then set them up in the JavaScript to actually to actually trigger. So we'll go back to the index.html, and just like when we had for uh, PG sign up, we had a little area where we had all of these divs that were pop-ups before the end of article. We're going to create some divs for pop-ups in, um, in the login screen. So before the end of article, should we copy? No, they're not, they're not that long to write and it's good to retype it because we're going to need to change IDs and such. So inside of the article, we need a div. Our first message will be account doesn't exist. Another possible error that would be at this screen is wrong password. We're going to do some simple messages here. 
some simple output when the person is trying to log in. Either the account doesn't exist, or there's a wrong password. Well, then both of these divs need to be set up to behave like pop-ups. Uh, so here's the part where we then add the data role pop-up class of UI content so that it's not transparent, basically. We can copy and paste that to both of them, save a little effort. One div will display one message, one div will display another message. Their basic structure is the same. What should be different? How can we tell them apart in the code? IDs. Different IDs, yes. So both of these need an ID. Based on the sort of syntax that we've done before, pop, error, login, um, not exists. So this is going to be a pop-up. It's an error pop-up in the login screen. Specific error, not exists. It doesn't exist. So another pop-up here. Pop error in the login screen. And this one is... Um, We'll call this one wrong password. Wrong pass. Oh, those line up exactly. So we're creating the HTML elements, the HTML nodes. We need to then create JavaScript objects for both of these. Then we need to write the JavaScript pop-up, the jQuery pop-up method to um, make this pop up. So this is what we want for the pop ups. Back in the JavaScript, we'll go back to the part where we've got all of our uh, object definitions near the top of the code. And we will create elements uh, via jQuery of each of these IDs. So this is where it really helps to copy these IDs. Remember, it's not a misspelling as long as you consistently use it misspelled. So uh, I'm going to copy that ID there, go back to the JavaScript, back to the very top of our code. We started to create these variables. So we've got one for the form, for those two pop-up errors, for that one success, then the next form, the login form, comma, on the previous line. So that then we can create L, pop, error, login, uh, not exists. Capital P on that equal to, a couple people missed this previously, remember to first put your dollar symbol right away for the jQuery selector to work. Quotes, pound, the name of that ID. So we're creating an object for this pop-up, we're creating an element for this pop-up based on that HTML ID comma we will do then the other possible error that was dollar l pop error log in wrong pass equal to dollar selector end of statement there and again um, if you don't have autocomplete i really recommend filling in the pairs so that you don't forget that there's a pair quotes pair of quotes Pound, pop, error, login, uh, wrong, pass. If you're calling these things exactly what I am, it was just serendipity, but it ended up that these are the exact same length. So if these don't line up here, you might have misspelled something.
So now we've got objects for we've got objects for um, those pop-ups. We'll go back to our if else statement where we're trying to log in and we will use the L pop up error not exist to pop up to the screen to tell the person this account doesn't exist. This account this account doesn't exist. And then eventually this password is wrong. So we'll go back to our if else statement inside of our function login. So back to the end of our code inside of the if else statement. Where, it's, where it had user doesn't exist. We're going to set up the pop up message as a pop up, so dot pop up. And then actually open it. With the options. Transition flip. So we've got a div that should behave like a pop up. Next line, it should then open and transition, it should animate as a flip. So now instead of just having console output, uh, we have something visual for the actual user. Go ahead and save and run that, and um, try to log in with an account that doesn't exist, and see if you get the pop-up message. So let's uh, check mine. Okay, I'm going to try to log in with an account that doesn't exist. Pop up, account doesn't exist. Good. If I then try to sign in with an account that does exist, we're not there yet. But this is the if else so far. It's checking simply if the account exists. To check if password matches, that's coming up in the else block. The first block here of this first if simply checks if the account exists. Next, we will check if passwords match. The password is stored in the device, in local storage, uh, attached to the email address by doing get item. Uh, our first part here, get item, check if that email, check if it's null, check if it's empty, meaning no account. Well, if this part fails, it's false, it goes to else. 
So here we're, we're checking. Is it true that that email is empty? Yes, it's true that that email is empty. The account doesn't exist. The only other possibility, no, it's not true that that email is empty. It must mean then the email is not empty. There's something in that email. There's some password associated with the email. So that's the else part. Yes, the account does exist. There is some email associated, there is some password associated with that email. So within the else block, now we need to check if these passwords match. So we need another if else. Comment here and if else to check if passwords match. And again, uh, confirm that you've got your pairs. It's very easy to lose track of these pairs. The whole idea is that in this first block of if, we'll put our conditional statement in a moment, but we're, we're going to do that our first block if, we'll, we'll check that the passwords do match, and the else of false will say that the passwords don't match. So some console log for us, passwords do match. <coughs> Passwords don't match. So the first block deals with passwords that match, and the second block deals with passwords that don't match. Because it's a console output, it doesn't quite matter, but you're right. Passwords do match, passwords don't match. That's what the first block concerns itself with, as opposed to the second. Well, what we're going to be checking in the if statement is the password the person is trying to type in, is it the same as the password we've got in local storage? The password the person is trying to type in is temp val in password log in so the person is trying to type in some password at the moment up there we're confirming that we see it we're trying to type in some password we need to check that that is exactly the same as the password in local storage triple equals. So this checks equality as well as type equality. It's the exact same password, but it's the exact same type of data. They're both numbers, they're both letters, they're both the same type. So triple equals there. Let's check the local storage dot get item. Now that has a pair of parentheses, very careful there. Local storage object get item uh, method. That's all inside of the um, if. It's got its pair get item. Temp val in email login. <clears throat> Yes, email. Here I'm checking, does this password match <coughs> this email? It makes it seem like that. But technically, no. We're not saying, does this password match this email? No. Using get item, 
we are going to get the data inside of a cookie named that person's email. So we need to know what their email is to get the item, look inside the item, and technically all of this get item should come back to us a password. Check if the password they're typing is exactly equal to the password we just retrieved based on their email. That's what that is. That's why one says password and one says email. Because based on the password, give me the based on the email, give me the password to check equality. Let's save it and run it at this point. It still won't fully log you in yet, but at the very least we should see now if passwords match. So of course, fill in log in with an account that does exist. Then try to log in with the wrong password and the right password to see both of those bits of feedback in the console. If you forgot what your password was, you can look in the developer's console in the local storage view, and it will tell you your password in raw data what it is, so you can test it. Let's see on mine. Um, I'm going to run this. Okay, so uh, I'm going to log in with um, an account that exists, cat at dog.com, and I'll run and I'll put the password in rabbits. Go. Passwords don't match. So it went through the first level of if else statements to check the user does exist. Then it's going into the second level of if else statements. Does this email does this password match an existing password? They don't match. Okay, so I'll try that again. I think the password is cat. Okay, so I'm going to try that again now with the correct password. Go. Passwords do match. So based on what has been saved into local storage, now I'm checking if they match or not. Right there. If the password they're trying to type in right now matches, the result of trying to get the password that has been saved, we get the output that they do match, we get the output that they don't match. Under else, that they don't match, we've got a pop-up waiting that can be uh, used. Oh, I did something over here, flip. No, uh, no parenthesis here, or no asterisk here, obviously. Um, but we've got uh, else over here. Uh, we need something like that. We've got those errors up there for um, user doesn't exist. We've got pop-ups for passwords don't match. L pop error log in. Um, Wrong pass. Initialize it as a pop up. Um, and then we've got actually pop up. So now to the user, we have some feedback, passwords don't match.
And similar to what we did when we were trying to, when we had them create an account, if they mismatched, if they mistyped their own password, we cleared the um, input fields. You mistyped your password, try again. You mismatched your password. Well, here, uh, pop up wrong password. So we're going to empty that, 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 um, that input field, L in password login dot val. We did this before. One of these fields I want to reset. I don't want to reset also the field of their password. That's annoying. They have to type their password and they have to type their email and their password. They mistyped their password. That's annoying. Only resetting the input field for the password is better for the user because they don't have to retype their pass uh, they don't have to retype their email just their password so I'm going to log in with the wrong password here pop up wrong password L in password login is not a function. Line 119. L in password login. Oh, yeah, it is not a function, of course. It's an <coughs> object. Sorry about that. Uh, so dollar L in password, not a parentheses here. It's not a function, it's an object. Uh, I meant parentheses here. So it didn't clear out my fields here. See, it's still filled in. So sorry about that. Uh, L in password login, no parentheses. It's not a function. It's an object. Dot val. That's a function. That's a method. Val. We are writing the value of nothing. <coughs> therefore, clearing the fields. That one field. says wrong password, it cleared the field, I put don't match, pop up, wrong password. We'll do one more thing, then we'll we'll wrap up for the day and have some lab time. The very last thing after all of this is okay. There is a user that exists. We're trying to log in with the right email. We're confirming the password. After all of that finally happens, we go to PG Home. We finally see the home screen of the project. All of this has been simply sign up and log in. Final step here, passwords do match. Final step is to move to PG Home. Now, because we're in the world of JavaScript here, the syntax is different. Whereas when we were in HTML, the way from, to move from screen to screen was with an href. We have a button in the HTML that when you click that button, href is set to PG Home. Well, we're in JavaScript, not the same syntax. JS syntax to move from jQuery mobile screen to jQuery mobile screen. What follows here is the syntax that we write to move from one section or screen to another screen in JavaScript. So I guess we'll say technically jQuery syntax. We have the jQuery selector. We're going to select something and then do something. So we've been using this dollar selector meaning to select something. 
We're going to select something, and we're going to do a method, each container. Quotes, colon, mobile, dash, page container. This is sort of saying the current screen. All of this here technically sort of says the current screen, this mobile page container, and it's got a very specific spelling. You get this out of the jQueryMobile.com site, of course. So that's got to be a colon, and then there's a dash there. The actual method, the thing that we do, quotes, change, we're going to move away from the current screen, we're going to change screens. Whatever the current screen is, we're going to change away from it. Comma, <coughs> quotes, pound PG home. Very different syntax. In HTML, it's href equals pound PG home. Here it's completely different. From the current page, we will change to PG home. And where we would have data transition uh, in HTML, it's another syntax in here, comma, curly braces. This is the same sort of syntax as over here. When this pop-up, when we opened this pop-up, we transitioned, we animated it as a flip. But when we're changing the current page container to a new page container, a new screen, we also can then do a transition flip or any other kind of animation. We'll keep it the same. Transition flip. So this line here, this is the JavaScript way uh, to jump from screen to screen. Whenever we need to programmatically move from one section to another section, we have this syntax. It's always going to be this part right here, meaning the current container. We're going to change. What will, what will be different will be here. Where are we going? So eventually, when we do other things, based on user input and such, we're going to use this. So the thing we really just need to change is what, what, what section are we moving to? We can change the animation, but it's always going to be a change, and it's always going to be the current container. So now, when we save this and run this, hopefully, finally, you get to the point where you log in with an account, and it finally takes you to the PG Home screen to start to use the app. Let's see. So I'm going to go back, refresh. I'm going to log in with cat dog, password cat. Click go. Animates to home. Nothing impressive at home yet at all. And I'm at home. I'm on the, you know, finally the home screen to the app to actually do something. Saving the comic, retrieving the comic, taking a photo, social media, whatever we're going to make the app do. We spent these days, and we still got a little bit more polish to do on Thursday. We spent all of this time simply setting up a login, logout system. There's still a lot of polish that can be done to it. But we have a way to create an account. And we have a way to log in to finally get us to this home screen. Uh, we're going to end the main lecture at this point. I'll put my code in the folder. We'll do some lab time. If it worked, great job. If it didn't, we'll figure it out. 
Um, then when we come back on Thursday, we'll put some more polish on the login, logout. Uh, we don't have a logout, for example, yet. And then we'll start to set up how the app continues to work. Any general questions on the code that we looked at today? We'll do one-on-one -on -one in a moment, but general questions on this system? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to put my code in the folder. This will be 220 without any temp on it. So in the network folder, I put a copy of my code up to this point. We'll have some lab time until 9.30 if you need it. <clears throat> 